In this video we're not looking at Leicas or 35mm film cameras, we are looking at medium format. And I thought I'd start the weekend early with the first of three videos starting with this camera, the Fuji GA645. Stay tuned and I'll tell you all you need to know about this amazing camera. Welcome back, Matt from MrLeica.com. So a different video for you today and as I say the first of three videos. So if you're not yet subscribed hit the subscribe button so not to miss the videos over the next two days. All three upcoming videos are medium format film cameras. So if you're into your film photography, you might find this of interest. Coming up, I'll cover all the camera specifications and example photos. And just before we jump into the camera review, if you'd like to support this channel, please hit the like button because it tells the YouTube algorithm to share this video with more viewers. And hopefully that will help grow the channel and then I can share more cameras and more lenses with you. Okay, with that said, let's get started. So the camera I've brought out for you today is the Fuji GA. 645 medium format film camera. This is a beefed up point and shoot camera. So one major difference between this camera and many of the cameras I review are most of the cameras I talk about are full manual cameras, whether it's like the vintage Leica 3s, Leica M cameras, things like this. Some of the cameras I've covered do have auto exposure and a couple of them have autofocus lenses. I'm thinking of the Hasbard H2 video. But for the most part, I tend to shoot with manual cameras. So this one's a bit different. Now I bought this camera back in 1995 and this is actually my second copy. My first one developed an electronic fault so feeling I was missing out I bought a second copy. I should probably try and get the first one repaired and then I'd have two working cameras. It's only probably a small quick fix for somebody that's got a larger brain than my small pea brain. So yeah I've had this camera for five years so I've got a fair amount of experience in using this camera. I've used it for kind of walkabout photography, I've used it for overseas model shoots, I've used it for weddings. So yeah, I feel like I know this camera enough to be able to give you guys a sufficiently detailed review. And that's already backed up by the existing Mr. Leica blog post. I'll put a link to the written blog post below. And most, if not all, the photos featured in this video, you can find full res in the link below, which will allow you to kind of zoom in on Flickr and see, see the full detail. You can't really see the images to sufficient detail on YouTube, so I find that's the best way if you want to critically kind of critique a picture. Okay, so a quick intro about this camera. As I say, this is the GA645. It is one of three main versions and five total versions of this type of camera. There is the GA645 Professional, which is this camera. This was released in 1995 and this has the 60mm f4 lens which is 35mm equivalent. There is also the GA645W which is the wide version. It looks very similar but it's got a 45 f4 lens on it. And then after that came the 645i and the 645wi which are kind of slight upgrades to the, these cameras. I think they came out in 97. And lastly there's a zoom model which is a Fuji GA645 ZI or ZI. Um, so those are the five kind of cameras in this kind of family of cameras. The GA is kind of the automated version. And then, and then there's another series of cameras called the GS range. So I also have a GS645, which I'll show you in a future video. Now in terms of size and weight, if you're watching this video, there's a reasonable chance you enjoy Leica photography will have an interest in, mainly because a lot of this channel is Leica related content. So with that being said, if you appreciate Leicas, I have to hand my Leica M6, which I'm sure you've seen in plenty of other videos. Now I fitted this with a 50mm lens. Now a 35mm Leica camera with 50mm lens weighs the same as a medium format 645 camera. The Fuji GA645 without batteries only weighs 815 grams. And that's roughly the same as a Leica with lens attached. So in terms of weight, you can have a 35 mil small negative Leica. Obviously Leica's are very nice, or, but, it, but if you want larger negatives, you can have a medium format 645 for the same weight, which is, this is actually heavy. I can feel the difference in my hand. This is probably 900 plus grams, 815, and they've both got batteries in. As I say, 815 without batteries, but it's still heavier. It's a notable difference if I was trying, it's kind of like that. 
Uh, so wait, if you want something lighter than a Leica, keep listening because this is lighter than a Leica. Next, in terms of size, try and do it so you can see. In terms of size, you can see the footprint of the GA645 is larger. It's difficult to see, isn't it? So with a standard size lens on the Leica, the Leica is longer, kind of front to back, than the GA645. But other than that, the GA645 is taller and wider. But it is a nice flat camera. Now again, this referring to Leica users. One popular bag for Leica shooters is a Billingham Hadley bag. I think Billingham Hadley Digital, the right to the above if I've got it wrong. Now, what, now the reason I brought this bag out is just to show you how small the Fuji camera is. So I can put two Leicas in my bag. I don't have this I don't have another one at hand. I've got another camera here, I'll put it in. Right, I've got two like I've got two cameras in the bag. Like so and then the way I tend to carry my Fuji is I'll put the, the padded bit down and then this is a perfect fit to go on top of a few other cameras. So say you, you want to have a day bag and you want a Leica and a couple of lenses and then you want a medium format camera too for those high resolution shots. Look at that. Try not to tip it out. So the Fuji GA645 fits absolutely perfectly into the top of a Billingham bag. I shut the top and then they can see I've got the equivalent of two Leicas with lenses and the, <laughs> and the Fuji GA605 all in this really compact bag. And there's still space to put in lots of extra things if you want to. So in terms of size, the Fuji GA645 absolutely ticks the box in terms of being a portable carry around camera and then the weight of it is just amazing you can carry this around this is like a carry around all day type of camera maybe like a walkabout camera or something for safer travel really good just a really nice weight now if you've watched enough of my videos you'll know that when i talk about weight i normally talk about the filter size so i may as well do the same thing the filter size of the fuji ga645 is 52 mil so the filters I use the most is a yellow filter, there's a black and white shooter. So there you go, standard yellow filter that I use on Leica lenses, some Leica lenses. 52mm, perfect, straight onto the GA645. That makes it very easy having a standard filter size. Now the question that's probably brewing at the back of your mind is, this sounds like a very nice camera, I wonder how much it costs. Now this camera's increase in price seemingly a ridiculous amount in the last few years in line with a lot of film cameras but seemingly even more so i bought my two copies of this camera i think in 95 and maybe 97 and i paid i think 350 for one maybe 400 450 for the other one the cost of the fuji ga645 in europe as at 2020 seems to be 900 pounds so it's more than doubled in price since I bought mine. Now it's not all bad news. The reason the price is high is because there are so few listed in Europe. So I guess the people that are listing them are just jacking the prices up. If you import these from Japan, they're listed for averaging 500, 500, 500 to 600 pounds. So even when you've added the import duty and VAT, for example, if you live in the UK, it's still going to be much cheaper to import a camera from Japan than it would be to buy in Europe. So do bear that in mind. I recently just imported a lens myself from Japan. So I'll perhaps do a future video on that for the, exactly that reason. You can save a lot of money by importing than paying over the odds in Europe. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work in the US. Um, maybe the availability is better. But with this being a Fujifilm camera made in Japan, the majority are going to be found in Japan. So guys in the US, again, you may find it better to import. Now in terms of the lens, this is one of the real strong points of this camera. The Fuji GA645 has the amazing Fujinon Super EBC 60mm f4 lens. As you can see, it's coated, but it's a lot more than coated. And I'm going to turn the camera on so you can see the lens close up. 
you may want to turn up your volume slightly because it's quite quiet and you might not be able to hear it. So with your volume turned up, I'll give you a second to adjust. You've got to listen quietly. It's not the quietest of cameras. This is not a stealth camera. But although it's noisy, the lens, as I say, is amazing. So back to lens for a second. As I say, this is a 60mm f4 lens, which makes it a 35mm equivalent in 35mm terms. Fujinon lenses are known to be extremely sharp, and this definitely ticks that box for me. One reason I still have this camera is because of the lens itself. This lens has a close focus of 0.7 meters, and it's actually a leaf shutter lens, meaning you can sync with flash at either 1 over 400 up to 1 over 700. Yeah, to use 1 over 700, I think you have to shoot it at f11. So think of it as 1 over 400. But that's like an eternity better than Leica cameras. If you don't shoot Leicas, Leicas sync at 1 over 50, Leica film cameras. So if you're a strobist, that is absolutely pointless. <laughs> I do still do flash photography with a Leica, but it is one of the least ideal cameras for flash photography. If you like flash photography, flash sync speed 1 over 400 with at f4. Now, now we're talking. Now this is kind of a really useful piece of kit. But before I get ahead of myself, as I say, a leaf shutter lens, meaning the shutter is in the lens and not in the camera body. And this lens seems to capture really nice colours when I do shoot colour film. And also really nice tones, whether it's black and white or colour film. Now onto the camera itself. Now this is what I could maybe call a fake rangefinder camera. So you're looking through the viewfinder like you would on a rangefinder camera. You're not looking through the lens like an SLR camera. Now the similarities to a rangefinder camera is when you look through the viewfinder, you see frame lines and you do see frame lines. One main difference to most cameras, when you look through the viewfinder, you see a horizontal photo, the same as you, the same, normally the same kind of shape as your camera, for example. So a horizontal picture, that's the frame that you'd normally see. When you look through the GA645, it's a vertical crop. So I'm seeing a vertical slice of view and so to take a landscape photo, I need to turn the camera like this. So this is for landscape. This is for portrait. So it's the opposite to how you'd normally use other cameras. For someone like myself that shoots 90 plus percent portraits, this is perfect because it's already in the orientation that I want to shoot in. And then to go to landscape, I'd probably go like this way because that's that's naturally how I'd shoot and keep my eye on the on the window. Now I said the Fuji was a fake rangefinder camera and that is because it's a autofocus lens. So the frame displayed in the viewfinder will give you the composition of your final photo but you're looking through the window like a rangefinder and not through the lens but there's no rangefinder patch so it's just like a it's a viewfinder. So it's basically a viewfinder without a rangefinder patch in the middle. And then instead of a range bundle patch in the middle, you have a, a cross, which is your autofocus point. And then half press on the top, it will focus. You can then recompose as needed and take your shot. Another thing to be aware of, this camera is parallax corrected, meaning when you first look to the viewfinder, you have frame lines that fill the whole viewfinder. And that is your composition for a distant subject because it will focus at 0.7 meters. When I half press focusing on you guys, the frame lines now move to the composition of a close focus photo. That's, that's, shh, that's really useful if you're focusing close to make sure you get in the correct composition. It displays the distance in the viewfinder. So for example, if I try and take a photo here, it's flashing saying 0.7 meters, meaning it's too close. So when I'll back up, now it's saying 0.9 meters, no flashing, so I could take the picture. Come closer again, 0.7 meters, it's flashing 0.7 meters, so I'm too close. Back up, try again, too close, try again, 0.8 meters. So when it's not flat, so when it's not flashing, you can take the picture. Shh. When it is flashing, you cannot take the picture. Well, if you do take the picture, it's going to be blurry because it's not going to be in focus. 
close focus limit 0.7 meters. So as you can probably hear, this is a auto focus camera. It also has auto rewind and the option of auto exposure. So if you're perhaps say the polar opposite of me and you just want to take the picture and you just want the camera to do the job without any faffing around and you want everything automated, this camera will be really good for you. I like to faff around and turn all the knobs and dials and do everything painfully slow because that makes it more rewarding to me. That's why I really enjoy kind of the really vintage Leica cameras and things like this. But that is the complete opposite to what some people want. Some people just want the final photo and they want a tool to capture the final photo as easy as possible with as little thoughts required as possible. This camera will do that for you. If you're say on a family trip and you don't have time to slow down and faff around with, I don't know, tripods if you shoot 4x5 or any other slow type of camera. You don't need light meters, you don't need anything. This would just do everything automatic for you. So all you do is put it into auto mode and then snap around like it's your iPhone. But with the advantage of it being a 645 format and high quality film negatives. So that is one plus for people that like that type of photography. So as I mentioned, this is a medium format film camera, 645 format. So there's the back of the camera. You've got most of your controls here. And then you've got the display on the top telling you what settings you're using. They're kind of the main, the main features I use. And then on the side of the camera, there's a little clasp. Pop that. And then there's the inside of the camera. So now you can clearly see the vertical orientation of the kind of portrait style crop. So vertical crop. So it's a 120 film, super simple. Drop it in one side, pull it across, clip it in, shut the back, half press, and it'll, it'll auto wind your film on for you. Very similar to loading a lot of the other film cameras, perhaps similar to say the Mamiya 6, Mamiya 7, anything like this with the kind of this style back door. Make sure if you're new to this camera, this is set to 120 because nearly all the film now is 120, not 220. And that makes sure the pressure plate is in the right place for the thinner roll of film, which is the 120 film. If that makes if that made no sense to you, just make sure the little button is next to the 120. If it isn't, slide it across like so. So that's the inside. Not much, more, not much more to say about that. Again, very similar to the Mamiya 6, Mamiya 7 and Fuji GF 670. To insert and remove spools, you need to press these red buttons like so and you see it pop out at the bottom here and then that basically allows you to take out your film spool so if you can't get your film out you need to press this first on the rear of the camera you'll also notice the flash button here if we press that now we have built-in pop-up flash like so which is a really neat design now again, if you're really into your auto everything film cameras, this will really suit you because pop-up flash can look kind of quite retro, quite cool. I tend to use off-camera flash personally, but you can use on-camera flash. Maybe I should use this in my next shoot and do some on-camera flash to kind of show you how it looks. I'll post some photos on social media if I get a chance to do that. So a very usable built-in flash, which you can use in auto mode. But equally a really nice feature, the GA645 has a hot shoe. That means I can do off-camera flash. So here's an example of me using off-camera flash. I'll just use the trigger on the top of the camera to fire off-camera speed lights. Really nice setup, meaning it's a good camera to use in the studio. Now, another nice feature about this camera is you see the word data. You can have your data printed onto your edge of your film negatives. So you can print like the date, the shutter, the aperture, and then the exposure compensation. That's a really nice feature if you're trying to remember what camera settings you used. So you can program what details you want displayed on your film and you can turn it on or off. So if you're not currently seeing that, you need to turn on that feature. Uh, maybe search the online manual on how to do that. It's probably easier than me trying to painfully talk you through it. Now in terms of settings, you can have manual mode, which is M mode, which is what I use. You can have standard aperture priority, you can have P mode, and you can also set your film ISO using this dial. I do find it quite useful to set my film ISO because then the camera will meter the light for me correctly and I can use that to kind of then adjust my manual settings. One small detail you might miss 
if you enjoy using uh, shift release cables. There's a small port on the side of the camera, see that? That's for, that's for a cable release. So just in case you wondered if it had that feature or not. Now with this being an automatic camera, you obviously need batteries. Now to load and unload the batteries, you need to undo this screw and the batteries fit inside the grip. So if you can see that, you need to CR123A batteries to run this camera. And then as I say, they just go into the grip. So in terms of what this camera is useful for or who it may suit, I'd say it's useful for kind of walkabout photography because it's so light or say travel photography. If you've got a vacation booked after COVID probably, if you've got a vacation booked and you want to get some high res photos and have a light camera to cover around your neck all day, and you want higher resolution than a Leica because the film negatives are three times larger, you're going to get a much higher resolution film scan than you would from a Leica camera. So lighter than a Leica and higher resolution makes it a really great partner to have perhaps with a Leica camera if you're booking, as I say, a trip. So really good for carrying anywhere because of the size and the weight. I've used this for wedding photography. I wouldn't say it's the best camera for wedding photography as the kind of the primary shooter, meaning if you are the photographer for the wedding, it's too noisy. You can just imagine it, it's the couple's big day. They're just about to exchange the rings. The church is silent. You line up your camera, you turn it on. <laughs> and the whole church would probably just stop and stare at you. And you probably wouldn't get many more jobs after that. Don't use this in a church wedding. I have used it in wedding situations, but I didn't use it in the church. I used it outside, kind of in the, the noisy surroundings. Not great for weddings because not only the noise, but the autofocus is too slow for anything fast moving. As I say, it is autofocus, but what I forgot to mention is it is slow autofocus. So if you're trying to do moving subjects, you're better to pre-focus on a point. Say you do street photography, you'd be better to pre-focus on a point and keep it half pressed just before the the subject walks through your frame. Don't try and track the subject because from my experience, it's just gonna be going <laughs> and you're like, come on, take the picture. And in those situations, that's when a Leica really shines because manual focus cameras kick ass when it comes to pre-focusing. And for people that don't use manual focus Leica cameras, they have a lot of benefits. So yes, you might think autofocus is amazing, so much better than a crappy manual focus, like a blah, blah, blah. Not necessarily true. Autofocus is nice, but as I say, it's too slow for fast moving targets. Don't buy this camera for the autofocus if you're looking to do anything with any kind of movement. For example, don't use this for, if you've got small kids, this is not a small kid, run around the house chasing them type camera. This is not a camera to photograph moving pets. Anything that involves any type of movement, use your iPhone <laughs> or use a camera with better autofocus. Okay, so mini rant about the autofocus. If you take photos of static subjects, really nice camera and you can benefit from the autofocus because you don't need 20-20 vision. And if your eyes are starting to go and you can't accurately focus your treasured Leica camera anymore, which I can relate to because my eyesight's not 20-20, so I can't focus SLR cameras, for example, at a distance because I just can't see. So anybody that doesn't have 20-20 vision, autofocus is extremely useful, but just bear in mind, better with static subjects. And then in terms of portraits, with me being a portrait photographer, is this camera the best for portraits? Mm, not really. I guess let me step back. It depends what type of portraits you shoot. If you see my portraits, I tend to fill the frame with the with the subject most of the time. A lot of people shoot portraits with a model much smaller in the frame. So if we call that, for example, an environmental portrait, which is kind of what it is, it's the subject within their environment in one photo rather than just the subject isolated, which is what I tend to shoot. I do do both, but I do gravitate towards filling the frame with my model. This camera will only focus to 0.7 meters, so other cameras are better for portraits. Let me put it that way. Another thing to bear in mind is this is a 60mm f4 lens. So this lens won't give you crazy shallow depth of field. So again, if you like really shallow depth of field, or say for example you enjoy headshot photography, again, not really suited, unless you're going to have the head at the bottom and then lots of environments above the head. 
you can't get close enough and you can't get the shallow depth of field. Now this camera could pair really well with another 645 camera which could use some portraits and then you could use this for everything else. So there's a nice example, here's one I prepared earlier. So sitting next to me, this is a portrait camera. This is the stunning Hasselblad H2. And this particular lens is a 100mm f2.2. So this is a true portrait fast lens on a 645 autofocus body. Now, now I've done videos on this camera already and I've done videos on the lenses available for this camera. So I'll include those links in the description below. Do check that out. So a great pairing would be this camera for your portraits and this camera for your walkabout for and after your portraits if you're shooting overseas, say me for example. If I want to explore the city and do some street shots, the Fuji GA645 is much more suited to walking around the town before and after the, the model shoots. And then when I want to isolate my subjects with super shallow depth of field, I'd use the Hasselblad H2. So as you can see in terms of size, they are very different. If I'm leaning this way, that's because this camera is a lot heavier than this camera. The little Fuji does have a lot of benefits, but for portraits, maybe look at cameras such as the, the Hasbro H2, the Contax, Mamiya. There's quite a few other 645 cameras which would do a better job of portraits, if that's your thing. Now the Hasbro H2 look big, but if you shoot a Mamiya RZ67 or perhaps a Pentax, you will appreciate the Fuji even more because it is so light. If you're used to carrying the very capable Pentax 67 or Mamiya RZ67 or even a Hasbad 6x6 setup. Yes, those cameras are amazing, but you're going to feel it if you're carrying the camera and a couple of lenses. Again, this is another really nice reason to pick up a almost pocket size medium format camera, which will still give you medium format, but it gives you 16 photos per roll compared to only 10 shots per roll if you're using an RZ, for example. So in terms of film economy, as I said before, I think 645 is a really nice sweet spot between 35mm and say 6x7. 6x7 is too few shots per roll for me personally and 35mm of the film negatives can be too small. So 645 is like the nice in-between spot. So that's it for the little Fuji GA645 and as I say today is Friday and I've got another video coming Saturday and a third video coming Sunday. All of these are going to be 645 format cameras and not the Hasblad because I've already done videos on that before. So now is a good time to subscribe if you've not already done so. Just to wrap this video up, please hit the like button if you didn't do so at the start of the video. Please share this video if you've got friends into film photography and they're looking for maybe a beefed up point and shoot camera or they're looking for a medium format camera to partner with their small 35mm cameras. And of course, feel free to comment. Do you own this camera? Are you tempted by this camera? Have you owned and sold this camera? Any comments, let me know below and I will get back to you. I do try and reply to all your comments. Big thanks to my amazing patrons for supporting the channel and see you guys back here tomorrow. Bye.